Aloha and welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm your adventure guide, Bear Wozniak at Deep Adventure Ministries. We believe that abandoning yourself to the adventure of God's will is the most radical thing you can do in life. And that's why we have as our guest today, David Bates. His website is restlesspilgrim.net and he has this really cool podcast called Pints with Jack. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Kickstart that engine and roll thunder with the pack. Explore the grittiness of manly spirituality. Gain traction in the virtues. Zoop up your spiritual engine by turning adversity into adventure. Now here's Bear Wozniak. Let's ride. Aloha. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm your adventure guide, Bear Wastick. I got to tell you guys, I was just out on the beach here. We live in Cocoa Beach, Florida, part of the year. This is where my wife is from, from this part of the, this part of the ocean, I guess, the Atlantic Ocean. And I live usually in the middle of the Pacific Ocean in Hawaii. But um, we just went for a walk along the beach, and seven miles away, they were launching a rocket for, from Kennedy Space Center. And it's just it's such a cool thing to be walking along the beach and to be able to witness this incredible thing. The, the, the rockets uh, take off, you see their light, it's like a candle taking off, and they accelerate so fast. After about a minute or so, you feel this rumbling in your chest and you hear it in your ears of the rockets as they're going off. And what really is cool here is nowadays, a lot of times when they, when they launch, uh, they, um, they re-land, when SpaceX launches, they'll re-land the booster rockets. So it's so cool, all of a sudden, from way above, almost straight above my head sometimes, you will look up and you'll see this two fiery burns uh, taking place as the rockets are slowing down as they re-enter. Then you hear a sonic boom. And then they re-land in a vertical, vertical upright position, 25-story high rockets. It's just so cool. Um, it's powerful. There's a word in Scripture, Paul's favorite word, in fact, dynamos. It means power. Uh, as powerful as those rocket engines are, they're nothing compared to the power uh, that God uh, wants to unleash in your life. You know, there's such a thing as nuclear fission. That's when you divide the smallest thing there is into two into two parts, and it causes this incredible nuclear explosion, right? When Jesus died on the cross, when his soul was separated from his body, a tremendous, powerful release of God's love, grace, mercy mercy was, was unleashed. His forgiveness was unleashed on uh, uh, wherever wherever you find yourself, whether you're in the deepest, darkest place, place, that mercy that can reach you, the power of his death on the cross and the dividing, not of the smallest <laughs> possible thing in the universe, but the greatest. When his soul separated from his body, tremendous power was unleashed. But what about nuclear fusion? When Jesus' soul and his body were, were when, he, when, was, when he was resurrected, body and soul. Another great, powerful release uh, uh, took place, and that's that power of the resurrection that we've been told about. So the death on the cross, great mercy. Uh, the resurrection, great life uh, meant for you and me. And our, our goal today is to abandon ourselves to the wild adventure of God's will and to live uh, life to the fullest. As he says, sometimes in Scripture it's translated eternal life, but uh, a more uh, more accurate trans translation is probably abundant life, or as we say in the pigeon translation of the Bible, life to the max. So we're excited to have our, our guest with us today, David Bates. This is he's a returning guest. We don't often have returning guests, but I, as soon as we got, had him on uh, a while ago, I thought I got to get him back. And we're kind of fortunate because David is not only an apologist, but he loves he's British, so he loves C.S. Lewis, G.K. Chesterton. He loves. Uh, a Tolkien, he's, he, 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 for, for all the right reasons, and he just got back from a C.S. Lewis conference. David, welcome back to the show. Hey there, Bear. It's great to be back. Uh, are you a little bit tired from just getting back? Where was the conference? I am. The conference was in North Carolina. It was the International C.S. Lewis Symposium, and I flew out at 10.30 p.m. from San Diego and arrived at 6 a.m. Uh, in Charlotte, and mm. the co-host from my podcast, he arrived two hours later, and then we drove two hours, and then we spent three days back-to-back -back lectures and meeting all other C.S. Lewis scholars, as well as C.S. Lewis's stepson, Douglas Gresham. That's who was so there. cool, man. That, that must have been... <laughs> so much, well, it is probably like shaking hands with a, a relative of a saint, you know, C.S. Lewis. Is, I mean, it meant so much to me personally in my, in my... He was the first 
book, David, that I ever read that I I had to chew like it was a steak. Mm-hmm. You know, I, every page he used words I never heard before, like pantheism. What's <laughs> that? You know, he'd use all these big words, and but his thoughts were so deep. I I, I was a young Christian. I was nineteen years old when I discovered C.S. Lewis. I'd just been baptized in the Holy Spirit, so I was so on fire. And uh, and uh, and the first book I read by by his was uh, Miracles. Oh, great one. The last night before I flew back to San Diego, I went back into Charlotte to give a talk at St. Thomas Aquinas Church there. And the main argument that I was giving, the title of the talk was C.S. Lewis, Apostle to the Skeptics. And I argue that what made Lewis so great was the fact that he satisfied the reason, but he also engaged the imagination. Oh, I, you know, I think you can say that so much of, uh, of G.K. also, right? And Absolutely. Tolkien, the, that, that's, that's, can you say that again? What did you say again? Uh, but Lewis, he satisfied your reason, but he engaged and ignited your imagination. Yes. When, when what do you Lewis, mean by that? Well, when, when Lewis would explain something, he would very often use an analogy, uh, a, a picture in your head for you to hang that idea on. Mm. For example, in Mere Christianity, he speaks about morality. And he's speaking against people that say morality is just simply about how we treat one another. And because that's the part of morality that we can generally all agree on that you shouldn't, that you should be nice to other people, you shouldn't be mean to them. And he says there are actually three parts of morality. It, there's the internal part, there's the external part, and what you might call maybe the teleological part. And he, he gives the example of, uh, of a, a, a fleet of ships. And he was giving these talks and Eventually, these were published as mere Christianity, but he was giving these talks on the radio during World War II. So the idea of uh, a fleet of ships was um, it, it was it was full of meaning for people mm. because at this time ships were going back and forth across the Atlantic and they were liable to to be destroyed by submarines. But he said, for a fleet of ships to make it safely to the, to its target port, he said that. They have to be in, in formation together, so they mustn't bang into one another. But he says that they also have to be rightly ordered internally, because when the fleet has to make uh, a, a maneuver, when they have to turn, if my personal ship, if the steering column is all rusty and, and uh, broken, I'm liable to start bumping into people. So that's why our internal morality is important, because it will inevitably uh, manifest itself in how we treat other people. And lastly, we have to be going in the right direction because if you, if you leave your port and you're a few degrees off, you might be aiming for New York, but you'll, you know, end up somewhere in Canada. And so he, he gave these pictures to help people understand the theology that he was explaining. But not only that, he communicated the Christian gospel in or even his non-apologetics works, things like the Chronicles of Narnia. And he also wrote a, a science fiction trilogy. And these ideas uh, were, were smuggled in to the books to allow mm. his readers, who might be a little bit resistant to Christianity, to, uh, to, to feel the Christian story in its potency by stripping it of its uh, stained glass and Sunday school images that would normally cause them to raise their defenses and be resistant to what he has to say. Okay, be, uh, just like C.S. Lewis, okay, now I've got to go back and read that page again. Okay, <laughs> so internal morality in, in the theme of the, of the ships, that's how the quality of the, the, the ship, your ship, mm-hmm. is running internally. It's, everything is tuned properly, the compass is working, and then that would be uh, how our inner morality... Yes, and then uh, having mm-hmm. having rightly ordered passions, as the church fathers would probably describe it. Okay, and then there's the external, uh, which is how we're working within the fleet, how we're yes. treating. We're not bumping into them. We're respecting the admiral. You know, we have our place, and we're doing that. We're we're helping. Uh, and we can and we can only do that if our ship is in good working order. So internally, there's a there's a morality, and then is that the word? It's morality that he was talking about. Yeah. And then there's that external of how we're fitting and working with others. But mm-hmm. then you mentioned the teleological. You clarify we, more about that. That we have to be heading in the right direction. That we have to be going towards our, the, the 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 port to which we should be going. And in this case, it's seeing that everything is ordered towards God and his purposes and his end. 
And so if we want to head off in our own direction, things are going to end badly. So we have the, our, our inner ship has to be functioning right. We have, to have a, we have to have be living a life of virtue, of the seven virtues. We need to have our passions ordered. Uh, mm-hmm. We need to also understand we have relationship with others and how, uh, how we are to function with, within our, within, with others. But yeah. beyond that, there is this, 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 this Godward uh, morality, this, this, God, this morality towards God. We have, the, we have been built with an inner guidance system that want, that's drawing us there, and we can reject it or we can, or we can fulfill our end. We can fulfill our purpose by seeking God, desiring God, and, and finding our safe harbor. That's just, that's it, just so, that's so C.S. Lewis. And it, and it alludes to that famous quote of St. Augustine that our hearts are made, uh, our hearts are restless, Lord, until they rest in you. That he, he is the port to which, well, towards well, which he, we should and, be journeying. And the, the sentence before that is, our hearts were made for you, our God. That is, there's the yes. theological, the theological statement. Hey, we're talking with someone who's real smart, David Bates. I'm going to try to keep up with him. Yeah, he really likes C.S. Lewis. I, I like C.S. Lewis, but if I, if I admit I do, then people want to talk with me, and they're probably smarter than me about it. So <laughs> try to, I try to avoid the subject. But we're talking with David Bates. His podcast is Pints with Jack, and his website is restlesspilgrim.net. Net. Dot net. Don't be going to dot com, everybody. Dot net. Hey, we want to invite you guys to go to uh, deepadventure.com and join Bears Man Cave for you men. Join Bears Man Cave. It's a secret Facebook group. You can't join it going to Facebook. You got to go to deepadventure.com, but you can join Bears Man Cave and we'll make you part of that, that group where we inspire and challenge, encourage each other. And we have every two or three weeks at random times, we have uh, video chat meetups where we, we actually talk to each other and we encourage each other and pray for each other. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. That's it. I don't want you to miss out on your free stuff at deepadventure.com. Go there and subscribe to our weekly email newsletter. You get free video content, including the Bear Wozniak radio show, video version on YouTube before it even airs on EWTN. And you can follow us on all of our social media. Go to deepadventure.com and subscribe. Plus, good stuff happens when you support us at patreon.com forward slash Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure. You get instant access to every radio show, Bear Wozniak Adventure, and our TV episodes, Long Ride Home, the instant we produce them, months before they even air. Plus, we give you all kinds of free stuff, coffee cups, t-shirts, and other things like that. Go to patreon.com forward slash Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure and become our patron. If you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to press the subscribe button and ring that bell. This is a warning. The Bear Wozniak Adventure is dangerous. The radical change Bear challenges you to is not for wimps. Change this station now to a soft rock station before it's too late. You've been warned. Now, here is Bear Wozniak. Aloha, welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure as of, as a guest with me today, David Bates. He loves, he's British, so naturally he has a fondness for C.S. Lewis, G.K. Chesterton, Tolkien. But I'll tell you, these are, I, I, don't, I have a, a tin picture of G.K. Chesterton. It's about three feet by two feet out on my lanai. It's made, it's printed onto tin so it won't fade or won't rust. I love G.K. Chesterton, but the first uh, British author, the first real author of substance that I came across, I had been under catechized. I didn't know there was an Aquinas or an Augustine and people like that as a young Catholic, but I came across C.S. Lewis. And it was such a good time for me. I was, I was going to university and I was like, going to Baylor, by the way, they're 9-0 and right now in football, but I, uh, <laughs> I, went, I went to Baylor and uh, I wanted an intellectual uh, satisfaction for my faith. I wanted to understand it intellectually. And that's what C.S. Lewis provided for me. I got, I read, I read um, his book um, *Miracles* and then read everything, you know. And so just really, just really fell in love with him. So I'm just really love, you know, your passion for him too. There's two things I would like for you to do for me. Well, first of all, I would like for you to tell us just within just a few minutes your your story, and then I'd like for you to tell us C.S. Lewis's story of his conversion because I believe he started out as an atheist, didn't he? 
uh, he, he went the long way around. He started as a Christian, he ended as a Christian and wandered in the middle. So he, uh, so it's almost like he read G.K. Chesterton's book, right? The he rediscovered that... Brighton, yes. He was, he, was, <laughs> he was very much the man who went out to find his own heresy and discovered orthodoxy. That's so cool. And the title of that book is what, again, that I'm referring to, that, The Man that Who is, be... That is always, actually, he mentions it in Orthodoxy. He, op he opens up the book by saying that he, he is like a man who left England uh, looking for the West Indies. I can't remember where he said he was going, but he was going to explore new lands, and he gets turned around in the storm, and he ends up on the beaches of Brighton. Yeah, right back where he started, kind of, right? Mm. Or is it, yeah. Yes. And who is, what is, the, what is the fictional book? I think it's The Man That Would Be Tuesday. I forget the name of that uh, book. The Man That Was Thursday. The Man That Was Thursday. Okay. It's very similar, too. <laughs> it's it, all days it, of the week. It's so cool. So C.S. Lewis was a Christian, and then he started questioning that, and yes. then ended up coming back all the stronger. Um, you know, they used to call St. Thomas uh, the bull. They said he's, he asked too many questions. Yep. They would call him the, the dumb ox in uh, his classmates, but the, his, his, his teacher said that the, the bellows of that ox will be heard throughout the world, and that's, that's definitely C.S. Lewis. So mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about your own conversion story, David. Well, I was raised in a Catholic home, and I, I had a spirituality as a child, but I really came into my own. I, 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 took, I, took, I appropriated my faith. It, it became mine when I went to university. And that was principally through the work of a Catholic community called Verbum Day. They had some missionaries mm, at my university. Really? And the big thing was prayer with scripture and evangelization. And so I was part of this vibrant community at, uh, at university. I was spending a lot of time in the word. And unfortunately, then I graduated university and went out into the big wide world and started experiencing regular Catholic parish life. Mm. where I got a new job in a town that I'd never been to before, and I went to Mass, and the music was awful, the preaching was insipid, there seemed to be no groups in the parish concerned with care for the poor or evangelization, and as a 20-something, I looked around the pews, and everybody seemed about a million years old. So I did what a lot of Catholics do. I went wandering. I went and found myself a Protestant community that were just fantastic. The preaching was wonderful. The, the music was, uh, it wasn't ornate, but it was, it was competently done and with great care and great love. The preaching was, was wonderful and it was all about application. This is what God's word says, so how does that affect your life? Mm. And eventually I started to see problems with the theology that I was hearing on Sundays. And I started digging into the early church, the early church fathers. And yeah, but how did, how did that happen? How do you dig into, how do you even know they're there? It, it, I didn't know they were there. For me, well, I drifted. If, if I had known they were there, I would have never drifted. I was just under, I, I was hungry. I was thirsty. I wanted more. I, I just, no one directed me to the early church fathers or through to Augustine. And how did you discover them? How did you even know they were existed? I wasn't taught about them either. For me, the question was initially about the, uh, the issue of baptism. Mm -hmm. So at, at my church, one of the assistant pastors got up at the beginning of one of the services and said, for those of you who have just had new children, if you would like to have your child baptized or dedicated, whatever's right for you, please contact mm. the office. And That's that was messy. a red flag for me. It, that like, feels it feels yucky, doesn't it? <laughs> yes. You don't <laughs> know what baptism does or whether or not children should be baptized. So that sent me into history to go and look at what what was the earliest record that we can have. Okay, well, here's the, here's the thing, David. I mean, like for me, when I, I had great Christian friends, and so I went that same, I went basically the same path you did um, after college, you know. Uh, but as far as I knew, no one had written anything earlier than 1500. You know, there's, Martin, <laughs> yeah. there's the Bible, and then there's Martin Luther, right? I didn't know. I, it was like there was this iron curtain almost of, I didn't know what was there. Isn't that terrible? I'm a university educated man and didn't know that the, that the early church fathers existed. You know? I was exactly I took the philosophy same. courses. I took, I took religion courses at a Baptist University, Baylor, but I, I never knew they existed. How did you find them? Well, firstly, they were just, I was just looking into history and I didn't know who the fathers were or have any, mm. any kind of sense of that. So I just started getting my, my, uh, my, my toes wet in looking at history. And then I went on a retreat. There's a Catholic, charism Catholic charismatic community in England that uh, meet at Walsingham every year. Mm. And it was there that I met Marcelino D'Ambrosio. Oh, I he, love him. I love he is, Marcelino. He is wonderful. Yeah. And he yeah. gave a short presentation on the early church and he described our family history. 
And he started mm. mentioning names that I that sounded vaguely familiar that I had seen in yeah. my earlier research of yeah. Augustine, Basil, Ignatius of Antioch, Clement of Rome. Athanasius. Exactly. Yeah. And so that Justin was... Justin Martyr. Oh, my God. Oh, they're so... Mm -hmm. You know, right here I have a whole, and then the whole I top shelf of my books. The whole top shelf of my whole top shelf of my bookcase here is the writings of the early church fathers. I just love them. And, like, and, and what, what jumped out at me was not only did these guys sound awfully Catholic, Ignatius of Antioch said <laughs> that the heretics abstain from my Eucharist because they do not confess that it is the flesh that, of Jesus Christ that was nailed to the cross and which the Father in his goodness raised from the dead. And he also said, they, if, I, if anything I say here isn't consistent with the teaching of the Bishop of Rome, <laughs> I stand corrected. He acknowledged the it, Bishop of Rome from, what was that, about 150? Or what, what year was that? Uh, Ignatius, he wrote his letters in about 107. And he wrote to he wrote seven letters to multiple churches and to his a fellow bishop called Polycarp. And you see the difference when he writes to Rome. Yeah. But, but it was particularly that letter to Rome that not only fed my imagination, we've spoken about imagination and reason, not only did that letter feed my, my reason when I was see, saw that the early church was Catholic, it also fired my imagination. Because mm -hmm. I saw in people like Ignatius a passion for Jesus Christ that was just so attractive. When he wrote, allow me to become an imitator of the passion of my God. Because oh. he's been taken to Rome in chains and he knows he's going to die. Right, right. And he was, at, at that time, he was old, he was nine, yes. in his nineties, maybe, or you know, he was, he was actually pretty old, old by anyone's standards. Mm -hmm. um, and he was the was he the um, I'm trying to remember the the lineology for him. So he was the 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 um, disciple of Polycarp. Probably, who, Polycarp, probably, was, no, probably, Polycarp was the disciple of John, and, um, and and Ignatius was the disciple of Polycarp. Is that how it goes? Is that the, uh, no, the no, day? they were they were. They were peers. They, oh, okay, they were okay, okay. They, they were friends. He, yeah. as he was taken in chains, he passed through Smyrna. But Ignatius was the bishop of Antioch, which was the the see at which Peter himself had once been bishop. Yeah. Amen. Wow. Yeah. So you found the early church fathers, and you you, you realize the primitive church was a Catholic church, and you're undone. I remember for me, it was reading Justin Martyr, and and when they when he began to quote uh, the Epiclesis. Mm -hmm. you know, that sounds almost exactly what I heard, heard, heard at Mass when I was a kid, you know, when they translated it to English, when they changed it over to English. And I was like, I was undone. I was like, oh, my God, I got to go I, back and find out what this is all about. I, I have a talk called Worship in the Early Church. And what I do is I look at first century Judaism and the things that uh, a, a religious Jew would, would do at that time. And then I show how the Christians took these things and uh, completed them by adding Christ and seeing the liturgy develop, firstly from the comments of people like Ignatius of Antioch, Hippolytus of Rome, which his, um, his dis discussion of the Epiclesis, you basically see it in today's Mass. Mm -hmm. uh, and then into Justin, where he gives blow by blow of what, ha what Christians do when they gather on Sunday, and it looks awfully familiar. <laughs> yeah. and, then, and then culminating in the liturgy of St. James, uh, mm. where we actually kind of play out what would happen. So I, I ordain somebody briefly to be a priest. I get a couple of bishops, uh, uh, and a, a few deacons, a choir, and we, we, we speak the words that Christians in the fourth century would speak when they went to church on Sunday. It's, it's, an ama it's amazing to go back. I love the way you said Marcellino introduced them as our family. Like, let me talk to you about our, you know, our family. Let me introduce you to your family, the roots, of, the roots of our faith. And it is so beautiful that Jesus wasn't this, you know, Jesus is, was a builder. The word in Greek for him isn't carpenter, it's technon, which just means builder. The only thing he said he was gonna build, or that we know that he built, was a church. And you know, he didn't just say, you know, here you guys, just do what you want with it. He had a structure. He had a foundation. He had, he had uh, a plan. And uh, it's not that our brothers and sisters that are not in the Catholic Church practicing this faith are not Christians. Believe me, I know. Their, their devotion is incredible. And, but it's almost like you're missing out on the fullness of faith. And we'd like for you to invite you to go to uh, restlesspilgrim.net. You'll find out more there with David Bates. We're going to come back and talk about his, uh, more about C.S. Lewis. His podcast about C.S. Lewis is called Pints with Jack. And by pint, you mean a pint of beer, I'm, I reckon. Absolutely. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> we'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak adventure. Hey, man. I don't want you to miss out on your free stuff at deepadventure.com. 
go there and subscribe to our weekly email newsletter. You get free video content, including the Bear Wozniak radio show, video version on YouTube before it even airs on EWTN. And you can follow us on all of our social media. Go to deepadventure.com and subscribe. Get your free stuff. And if you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to press the subscribe button and ring that little bell. Don't miss out. Aloha, this is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm your adventure guide, Bear Wozniak. What a privilege uh, for me to be hosting this show. Uh, it's not something that just happens because you want it to happen. It's something that God places in your heart and then you work really, really hard. But you can work as hard as you want to and things like this don't happen unless they're God's will. And it's just, what a blessing for me to be with David Bates, a man who loves, uh, you know, my, the roots of my, my Christianity, uh, you know, being raised Catholic, but my first exposure to, to brilliant minds was C.S. Lewis and, and, uh, and then eventually G.K. Chesterton. But I never got to talk with people about him, <laughs> you know. And then, and then I, eventually, David, I joined um, a group in Hawaii, the G.K. A GK Chesterton group there, and I'd go there and I'd go, oh, man, they're using those words again that I read but never heard anybody say, so that must be the right way to say them. And I was so <laughs> thrilled. And then just to get to have the privilege to talk with you about these great uh, men uh, that mean so much to me. What a privilege. You, you just got back from the C.S. Lewis conference. Can you tell us a little bit about C.S. Lewis? He's not, he's not a Catholic. Uh, he made his way towards orthodoxy, never quite became a Catholic, but he's, he's, uh, he's cheering for us all to become Catholic now that he's in heaven. Right? <laughs> so tell us about C.S. Lewis, his, his, his journey towards faith. So as much as I would love to claim him as an Englishman, because uh, a lot of people think he was English, and even if they've, particularly if they've heard him speak, there are a few recordings left on YouTube, uh, he wasn't actually English. He was born and raised in Northern Ireland, and he... The land, of, scho land of scholars and saints. Exactly. <laughs> and and wow. he had tragedy very early in his life. Mm. When he was nine, his mother died of cancer, and his father soon afterwards sent him to schools in England, boarding schools, which he hated. Um, and uh, as a child, he insisted on being called Jack, and that's why our podcast is called Pints with Jack. And who's was, your co-host? Uh, a guy called Matt Bush, and okay. he also came with me to the conference. We, okay. we, we, we met and uh, uh, got to hang out and recorded uh, um, an episode each night talking about all the great talks we'd heard. Uh, but Lewis, he was sent to England for his schooling and, uh, on his 19th birthday, he went to the front lines of the trenches of world war one and experienced all of the death and tragedy there. And cause actually over the course of his schooling, although he'd been raised in a church violent home, he had progressively become an atheist, uh, principally because he saw death and destruction in his own life and now on full display in World War One, And also, when he was at school, he did the classics. So he read a lot of the pagan writers. And his masters would tell him that paganism was all false and Christianity was all true. And that just didn't seem right to him. And so he just regarded Christianity as yet another myth. What, what do you mean by the pagan writers? Do you, you mean philosophy or do you mean the great... All, all of it, the, the, yeah, the, the, the philosophy and the, the stories of the pagan gods. Isn't, what, didn't, didn't he say, was it he, in one of his books, I, I think it's in, the, in the, um, um, the Narnia tales where, he said, where, where the older man says, it's all in Plato, it's all in Plato. Yes, that's in the, in the last battle. It's, it's, it, I think it's almost on the final page. Uh, <laughs> so he loved, he never did lose his love for those. And you know, the early church fathers called some of them saints. It's almost like at the year 500 BC, there was an infusion of, of rationality in the Greeks, uh, and there was an infusion of revelation in the Hebrews. Yes, among the church fathers, you find them talking about what happened, particularly among Greek philosophy, as being preparatory in a, in a similar way too, but obviously uh, not, not in, an, in a fully inspired sense, but in the same way that they said that God prepared the Hebrew people through the prophets, he prepared the pagan world through the pagan poets and philosophers. Yes, I think so. It's, so, uh, so, he, so he, made a, he made a little jab right there back to... <laughs> okay, go ahead. I'm sorry I interrupted you. Oh, no worries. <laughs> he, uh, he returned from the trenches. He was wounded when a shell fell too short. It killed two of his comrades and injured him, and he returned to England, and he returned to school, his schooling, and he got three degrees, um, got firsts in all of them. And 
this is where he started he started seeing the the how atheism and materialism he 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 found it didn't fully explain the world. Uh, earlier, he had complained about uh, the problem of pain and death and destruction, and that is the, the problem, isn't it? That is the problem. It's what probably was, the best argument for atheism. Yeah, yeah. But, but Lewis would later argue in *Mere Christianity*. He says his argument for atheism was that the world was so unjust. But he said, "Where had I got this idea of just and unjust?" Right. He says a man doesn't doesn't call a line crooked unless he's got an idea of a straight line. Amen. Yeah. To what was he comparing the universe when he called it unjust? And in mere Christianity, he develops this in an, in an argument for morality. Mm-hmm. So he's, he started intellectually seeing the problems with his atheism. And he said his books turned against him because all of the pag- all of the atheistic authors, the people that he was philosophically aligned with, he found them very shallow. But mm-hmm. he found he could really feed on all of the religious authors, whether they were ancient people like Plato, or whether they were modern, such as George MacDonald or G.K. Chesterton. Mm-hmm. And he actually said when he read Chesterton's Everlasting Man, it was the first time he had seen history laid out from a Christian point of view, and it really kind of made sense. He oh, thought Chesterton, yeah. Was, yeah, Chesterton that... was the most reasonable man in England, except his Christianity. I mean, but you look at the guys in England now, like Dawkins and those guys, the, the neo-atheists, um, they're ba- basically, to me, they're like knuckle-draggers. You can tell they have a lot of angst, and they're not thinking logically. But when you run into thinkers like Nietzsche, everything he said was like a machine gun bullet, man. His words were strung together so powerfully. Um, and now, uh, you know, and not to say that he was correct, but I mean, um, at some point, at some point, their logic just kind of runs out. But the, the neo-atheists, the, 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 um, the, the, that, what they call themselves, what, the, the... The four horsemen of the apocalypse. The four horses, the, the new brights, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, they're, uh, to me, they're knuckle draggers compared to a Nietzsche or compared, compared to a C.S. Lewis, where they're really, so much of what they seem to say in their books, and I've read them, is just basically um, uh, twisting truth, mm-hmm. uh, not really seeking truth. Two different things completely. And C.S. Lewis made the statement that his book's, turned against him is that what you said the books yes, he wrote or the books that he loved the books that he loved and the ones that he was reading he said mm-hmm. a young man if he wishes to remain a faithful atheist he can never be too careful of his reading there are traps everywhere <laughs> it's like what uh, what uh, cardinal newman's uh, what newman said um that to be to be uh what is deep it? in history is to cease to, to be protestant yeah to be it's to become catholic i'm a big and, fan of, of history too do you read i know you i'm warren carroll i've read all of his 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 whole all of his volumes. I just love to read history. I don't know why. Why am I so drawn? I just read history, history. I, I sometimes I'll read a new book that's five hundred years old. You know what I mean? I pretty much live back there. Well, Lewis said, "My own eyes are not enough for me." He mm. saw literature as a means of looking through somebody else's spectacles to be able mm. to live their lives and and to learn some something more about human nature. And so, what ha- what was his path? Then he said his book started ganging up on him. So principally through philosophy and he was starting to be surrounded by believers on left and right and they seemed so reasonable. And so he says, you must pitch me alone in my room, night after night, feeling the steady, unrelenting approach of him who I so earnestly desired not to meet. And then then he said, I eventually gave in, admitted that God was God and knelt and prayed. Perhaps that night, the most dejected and reluctant convert in all England. Now, did he come to Christ or did he just, did he be... no, the, the, so this was, his, he was just a theist. It's good. It's it, that's the that's what. And I was telling you about Anton Flew, how he, the great atheist of the uh, last century, when we were talking once before, mm-hmm. uh, he went, he first made the leap to being a theist, and then the only path to go from there logically for him was Christianity. So what what about C.S. Lewis? So the next step, we really need to talk about his friends, and he formed the inklings uh, uh, around him, uh, a gr- a group of writers. Um, and particularly people like J.R.R. R. Tolkien, Hugo Dyson, Charles Williams, Owen Barfield. And as, the, as these people were around him, they helped him clear away the final obstacles towards Christianity. Mm. Earlier I said that he viewed Christianity as just another myth. He described myths as lies breathed through silver. So these are full stories, but they're so pretty and attractive. Mm-hmm. And one night, Dyson and Tolkien, they had dinner with Lewis, and they went on a long walk at, along Addison's Walk, which was near, near where Lewis's rooms were. And they spent the night talking about myth. And 
Dyson and Tolkien helped Lewis see that he had been resistant to Christianity uh, because of its truth claims. And they said that you can regard Christianity as a myth in so far as that it is communicating all of the things that you loved in the earlier myths. But there is one very important difference. It's true. In the, in, the, in, in the years preceding Christ, the pagans had intuited a dying and rising God. They knew that they needed salvation. Mm-hmm. And in Jesus of Nazareth, myth became fact. Isn't that cool? It's like, yeah, it's so well said. David, it's so cool, man. So, so C.S. Lewis, um, his love for myth, and you can see it in Tolkien's writing, right? You know, you can mm-hmm. see it, especially in his. But um, there are archetypes, but there is a real uh, icon, and that's Jesus Christ incarnate, the, the, uh, the image of God, the full body, blood, soul, and divinity, and we made in his image. David Bates, his, uh, his podcast is called Pints with Jack, which is such a great name, and which um, Jack was C.S. Lewis, liked to be called that when he was younger. And uh, your website is pintsforjack.com and restlesspilgrim.net. Restlesspilgrim.net. This is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We'll be right back. Good stuff happens when you support us at patreon.com forward slash Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure. You get instant access to every radio show, Bear Wozniak Adventure, and our TV episodes, Long Ride Home, the instant we produce them, months before they even air. Plus, we give you all kinds of free stuff, coffee cups, t-shirts, and other things like that. Go to patreon.com forward slash Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure and become our patron. If you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to press the subscribe button and ring that bell. Aloha. Welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We're with David Bates. He just came back from a C.S. Lewis conference to which I, w- I never got the invitation. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> I would have loved to have gone there, but you just got back. And one of the things that you were talking about in the last segment was about how he gathered a community around him. Mm-hmm. And one of the speakers at this conference, you said, just really stopped you in your tracks when they begin to communicate about that. Absolutely. Diana Glyer, she has written a book called Bandersnatch, and her more scholarly work is called The Company They Keep. Mm -hmm. And she gave a a talk to everyone there that was drawing heavily on her research. And she basically told the story of C.S. Lewis and particularly Tolkien and explained how very different the two of them were. So when they first met, Lewis was still an atheist, and Tolkien had always been a Catholic. And uh, apparently, in, in Lewis's diary, uh, he describes his first meeting Tolkien, and he says, he's, uh, he's a nice fellow, only needs a slap or two. <laughs> but, That's very but, British. <laughs> oh, very. <laughs> uh, but the, the two men, the, the, they cared very much about the same sorts of things, about words and language and, and study. Uh, but they also had very differing opinions and differing personalities. Uh, Tolkien, he always took great care in his appearance, would wear bright waistcoats, much like the uh, the hobbits, what uh, Americans would typically call a vest. And every description we have of Lewis, it describes him as a scruffy farmer or as as a student. Uh, so they were they were quite different men. They wrote in different ways. Uh, but she argued that these two men, they formed what she called a dyad. Uh, a pair of two people that care about the same thing, but with enough differences that they really push one another on. And she gave examples, for example, in the songwriting of the Beatles. You have Paul McCartney and John Lennon, both very talented, but also quite kind of different. Mm-hmm. And she described the inkling me- Inklings meetings. because So they would meet on Tuesday mornings to discuss philosophy, theology, church pol- politics, and university politics. And then on Thursday nights, They would gather and they would read one another's manuscripts. And this actually grew out of the relationship between Lewis and Tolkien because they had been meeting on Monday nights, uh, I'm sorry, Monday, uh, just before lunch at Tolkien's rooms. And then they would go to the Eastgate Hotel for lunch and talk. And after they'd been doing this for about a year, Tolkien offered Lewis uh, his work on Baron and Luthien, this uh, epic poem that he had written. And Lewis went home read it and absolutely loved it and wrote a thank you note to him that night saying that he'd never enjoyed anything as much and he'd have enjoyed it just as much as if it had been an anonymous book that he had found at a bookstore. P.S. More notes will follow with quibbles and suggestions. (laughs) And a little bit later, Tolkien received 14 pages of notes from Lewis. 
with suggestions and changes. And he'd even rewritten large sections of it. But the funny thing is Tolkien appreciated that second letter even more. Mm-hmm. And it was, it was, it was, it's like the proverb where it talks about iron sharpens iron. Mm-hmm. And these two men, they sharpened one another and pushed mm-hmm. one another. I mean, the very fact that we have the Lord of the Rings, we can thank Lewis for it because Lewis was the one who badgered him and encouraged him and helped him get it published. Uh, cause Tolkien, he was rather prone to procrastination. Well, what happened first? Who, who wrote the first fictional work? Uh, what was the, was C.S. Lewis's first? Was it, was it, um, the Narnia, or was it uh, the Space Trilogy, or what was it? Well, I mean, honestly, Tolkien had been working on The Lord of the Rings Legendarium his entire life. Yeah, so that's what, it's, it seems that. to me almost <laughs> like, like, like Tolkien might have inspired this very much. C.S. Lewis, I don't th- you don't think of him as being someone who would write books like that. Although well, they're, they're it, po- apologetic in nature, but I mean, um, I wonder if Tolkien inspired him in some way. Hey, I can do well, that too, or something. Well, they actually had a conversation, and Lewis said, Tollers, which is what he called him, Tolkien, Tollers, there aren't enough people writing the sorts of books that we really enjoy. I think we're going to have to write them ourselves. And then mm. they had a wager. They tossed a coin, and one of them was going to write a time travel book, and the other one was going to write a space travel book. And Lewis got the space travel, and that became the Ransom trilogy, the Cosmic trilogy. So that's out of the Silent Planet, Perilandra, and that hideous strength. Tolkien got the time travel story, and like I said, he was a bit of a procrastinator, and uh, would he very often didn't finish stuff that he had started. And so, while Lewis's trilogy was published, his work all was three set books aside. were published in his. In his. Okay. And Tolkien never finished his, but it was also something of the inspiration for Lord of the Rings mm-hmm. and his Hobbit. Yeah, oh, it's so beautiful, you know. And the, the space trilogy, what you know, what a, a unique concept. It, you know, the what was it? Is it out of the silent planet Earth? Like what happened at Earth? Uh, we're talking to David Bates. He loves uh, C.S. Lewis, G.K. Chesterton, Tolkien, and uh, he has a podcast called Pints with Jack. C.S. Lewis's nickname is Jack. But tell us, uh, tell us a little bit more about what what was? Why did they come up with the term inkling? The inklings for their group. From what I recall, there was actually a group that already existed called the Inklings, but uh, it effectively disbanded. And so they took it up as their own because they liked the name because it was a lovely play on words. Because if you have an inkling, you have something of an idea. And that's what this group did. People brought their ideas, their their, their preliminary inklings of, of their work. And it was faced to the scrutiny of the group, which was apparently pretty brutal at times. Mm-hmm. And also, uh, someone who is an inkling dabbles in ink. And right. that's what they were. They were all writers. And so so, the, so you talked about that sense of, uh, of community. You know, it, it says in, I think it's, it's Psalm 1 that says, don't sit around the gate where scoffers are. I have a mm-hmm. friend who uh, the, was the team uh, preacher for um, the Miami Hurricanes where they won all their championships. And he makes a statement, certain people he won't hang around with because he says they're not on my championship diet. <laughs> now, I want to I be around with people that inspire me and challenge me. Not that you can't reach out to people that are in need, but you don't have to sit or hang around with them and have them bring you down. Wouldn't you rather hang out, hang out with people that will inspire you and challenge you and, and, uh, and help you to develop your intellect, your, your faith, your, your faith journey, and your moral virtue? Absolutely. And that was really the final part of Diana Glyer's presentation after she had told the story of Lewis, Tolkien, the Inklings, and how the dynamic between the two of them was what really drove the Inklings. She basically appealed to us to have diverse groups and uh, close friends who would push us uh, to be more creative. And actually tonight, we're going to have the first meeting of a little Inklings group that I've got here in San Diego, where people are just invited to bring with them literature and poetry that they love. And just to, we're going to meet at the British pub, we're going to have a few pints, and we're just going to read to one another. Because I always loved poetry as a child, but I, I sort of fell away from it. And so my my knowledge of poetry is, is pretty meager. And so I'm personally expecting this group to really challenge me and expose me to poets that I haven't heard before and to discover the worth in poets that I've read before but just didn't understand. But this comes back to this whole thing about brotherhood. 
Uh, men are men are men are so isolated and lonely these days. It seems like to me they don't. They've come, we've kind of lost our way in the modern society, and we've become fragmented and, and separated from each other. And that's why you know in your own in, the Inklings is certainly a group most of us probably wouldn't uh, be able to handle. But but within your own amongst your own peers. Uh, there's a need for people to come together, small cell groups within your church. I know like our, our church here in Florida, Holy Name of Jesus, 70, 80 percent of the church has gone through a Christ Renews His Parish mission, and then they have small cell groups as a result of that. And then there's, men's, there's a men's group here called uh, Live for More, and, there's, and they have a quarterly big event, but they have small men's groups that get together. Um, the That Man Is You program is, is ideal f- to for people who, who, you know, if you don't have a men's group in your parish, it's probably your fault. You want one, if you have an inkling to have one, then go make one, and you can do that uh, with That Man Is You. Uh, and, and, other, and like the Bears Man Cave that we do through our, through our ministry. Go ahead. Absolutely. I, I, I have my own little men's group, and it was a handful of us that we realized that we needed to be accountable to one another and encourage one another. So we just decided, right, once a, once twice a month we're going to get together either over a coffee or a pint at a brewery and we're going to meet and for this very purpose to challenge one another and encourage one another and over the course of our group we've had most people get married had children and really live some some life go through some some wonderful wonderful uh, joys but also some some real difficult uh, mm. some real difficult times and that's when Friendship. I mean, really good quality friendship find out who your makes are. all the difference. Oh, absolutely. Lone rangers tend to get picked off by the enemy. You know, it was the stragglers in, in the wilderness uh, that I believe it was the Ammonites would come and would, would pick off if you, they, they were isolated from the rest of the of the of the um, uh, of the tribe. You, you have to. Uh, yes. Do not neglect the gathering of, you know, of of the believers. But you need it to is. have a, you need to have a small group of people. You know, my favorite thing to do is breakfast. Get together like six a.m. Have breakfast with some guys, and have you know talk about football. I always say, talk about football, but no politics. <laughs> we're going to talk about so, a little bit. Was. We're going to go one deep, one level deeper than that, and help help uh, challenge and encourage one another. We're we'll talking with David Bates. David, what is your website and your podcast again? My website is restlesspilgrim.net. That's where I blog. And pintsforjack.com. There you can find our podcast, which releases every Tuesday. And we also have a YouTube video series that we've recorded on the 12 central themes of mere Christianity. Wow. It's such a privilege to talk with David Bates. This is your adventure guide, Bear Wozniak. Uh, until next time, may the breath of the Holy Spirit aloha you. Aloha. I don't want you to miss out on your free stuff at deepadventure.com. Go there and subscribe to our weekly email newsletter. You get free video content, including the Bear Wozniak radio show, video version on YouTube before it even airs on EWTN. And you can follow us on all of our social media. Go to deepadventure.com and subscribe. Plus, good stuff happens when you support us at patreon.com forward slash Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure. You get instant access to every radio show, Bear Wozniak Adventure, and our TV episodes, Long Ride Home, the instant we produce them, months before they even air. Plus, we give you all kinds of free stuff, coffee cups, t-shirts, and other things like that. Go to patreon.com forward slash Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure and become our patron. If you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to press the subscribe button and ring that bell.